Advances in aviation history give way to legendary aircraft that become the most powerful and innovative weapons of our time. Each airframe is unique with limitless capabilities. But one thing remains the same. Underneath the surface, they are all simply great planes. First deployed in the early 50s, the Boeing B-52 is the Strategic Air Command's primary weapon of deterrence. With its tremendous range, it could deliver its nuclear payload anywhere in the world. Today, the B-52 flies in low-level bombing and electronic warfare missions as well. I'm Paul Max Milga, and we're here at Langley Air Force Base in Hampton, Virginia. Join me as we tell the remarkable story of the B-52 Straddle Fortress. Lieutenant Colonel Rick Bell currently works at Air Combat Command Headquarters at Langley. Before that, he spent nearly two decades behind the controls of the B-52. RD. Max. Good to see you, man. You too. Thanks, thanks for, for coming out and spending a few minutes to talk to us about the, the mighty buff. Well, thanks for having me. I yeah, appreciate cool. it. Yeah, cool. Now, this plane itself at Langley Air Force Base, what can you tell me about this aircraft specifically? This plane was brought here to be a, a dedicated memorial for those crew members formerly that have fallen in combat while flying B-52 combat missions. And Max, as you probably know, Buff's flown in not only Vietnam, mm -hmm. but it's been an Allied force, Desert Storm 1, Desert Storm 2, OEF, OIF, Desert Fox, been involved in a lot of things. We've had a lot of comrades fall in B-52s. So this this isn't just a regular plane on a stick, and this this one really represents right. something, especially to, to you guys. Absolutely, and this one in particular last did fly in Vietnam out of Anderson and Guam is where its claim to fame come. And it's a long, actually in long trip. Roger that. Before we talk about the mighty buff itself, tell me about your qualifications and your history in the plane. Okay, well, I started flying buffs back in 1988. Flew for 18 88. years. 88. You're gonna look that old. Oh. <laughs> it aged me well, I guess. <laughs> uh, flew for 18 straight years uh, at the wing level, and then uh, at that time, I had to do my duty and come to a staff job here at Langley Air Force Base, and Happens that's the where best I'm at of us, now. Huh? But I got about 4,200 hours in the airplane and loved wow. everyone. No complaints, huh? Zero. 4,200 so, hours? Roger that. So you you know the buff. Pretty well. When it goes into service in 1955, the B-52 represents the pinnacle of jet bomber design. But its story begins 10 years earlier. Throughout much of World War II, the Department of Defense focuses on war technology that production lines can churn out quickly. For example, the improved piston engines that drive every American aircraft in the war. Even the massive Boeing B-29, considered the ultimate in aviation technology, with more speed, range, and payload than any other bomber, depends on piston engine technology. But soon, a new breed of aircraft will render the B-29 obsolete. Early in the war, the United States is shocked to learn that Germany and Britain have developed gas turbine jet engines that could soon propel fighters at speeds surpassing the fabled superfortress. In 1944, the American Army Air Corps requires an all-jet bomber, fast enough to elude jet fighters. Five designs win contracts. Before they can be fully developed, another technological marvel, nuclear fission, brings the war to a dramatic end. A single B-29 drops a single bomb. 
annihilating Hiroshima in seconds. Three days later, Nagasaki meets the same fate. One aircraft can carry such a devastating payload. Are large fleets of bombers obsolete? The dreadful human cost that America paid to establish B-29 bases in the Pacific influences the next generation of bombers. After the war, focus shifts to delivering the atomic bomb over very long distances. The Air Force emphasizes long-range intercontinental aircraft, a role that the Convair B-36 Peacemaker had filled. The giant B-36 is really a Second World War design, born too late for combat, and requires six massive piston engines to reach average speeds. But later, jet engines and pods under the wings supplement its power. By 1947, the jet bomber project starts bearing fruit. Five submissions get tested, although by now, they're classed as medium-range bombers. The B-45, the first of the jets from the 1944 requirement, is the second most successful. The Air Force adopts this simple but effective four-engine design, though mainly for reconnaissance. Consolidated offers the B-46 as another four-engine jet bomber, featuring elegant lines and adequate performance. However, consolidated, heavily committed to B-36 production doesn't make the medium bomber project a priority. The B-48, a cumbersome aircraft, holds six jet engines in mid-wing clusters. Its biggest innovation is a bicycle undercarriage supported by two outrigger wheels on each wing. This project doesn't tempt the Air Force, and like the B-46, the prototype gets scrapped. Northrop, in its bid for the jet bomber contract, retrofits its piston engine flying wing with eight turbojets. The brilliantly designed wing, years ahead of its time, fails to attract government approval. But Northrop's technological foresight pays off 40 years later in the B-2 stealth bomber. Today, the B-2's wing symbolizes cutting-edge aviation design, but in 1947, the idea is too revolutionary. The design that most impresses the Air Force comes from Boeing, which bases its B-47 Stratojet on German swept-wing technology.
The six engines have to be suspended on pylons spread across the extremely thin, flexible, and efficient wings. The layout improves aerodynamics at speed and simplifies engine servicing. Because the wing is so thin, Boeing borrows Martin's B-48 bicycle undercarriage innovation. With the B-47, Boeing strikes the right design at the right time and produces hundreds of the planes for the Air Force in the early 50s. Besides becoming an instant success, the B-47 gives Boeing the opportunity to develop even more efficient swept wing jet bombers eventually leading to the development of the B-52. The B-52 is nicknamed Buff, short for Big, Ugly, Fat Fellow. With the success of their B-47, Boeing continues to push forward, developing bigger and better jet bombers. The medium bomber project gives Boeing an edge in the development of a new long-range heavy bomber to replace the aging B-36 Peacemaker. Trying to keep the Peacemaker project alive, Convair produces the XB-60, an all-jet swept wing version. But this warmed over Second World War design fails to impress the Air Force. As far back as 1946, the Air Force commissioned Boeing to develop a replacement for the Peacemaker. The company explores hundreds of concepts, ranging from ultra large piston engines to compound supercharged power plants to turboprops but nothing provides the boost over the B-36 that the Air Force demands. Exploiting the efficiency of the B-47's full swept wing, Boeing proposes another all-jet design based loosely on its medium bomber, but much, much larger. They refine the idea on model 464-67, which the Air Force accepts and dubs the B-52. In October 1948, the Air Force orders two prototypes, the X and Y models. Minor problems delay the X model, but here the YB-52 gets tested at Edwards Air Force Base. Its overall shape and fighter-like canopy resembles the B-47, but with greater size and performance. Artie, this wing is huge. What is the span on that? It's about 180 feet wingtip to wingtip. What's the length of the About thing? 160. So it's wider than it is long. It is, a little bit. The, the tip gear, which are up right now, are just about a, just under 150 feet from wingtip to wingtip. Um, tip gear, that is. And the so no, gear, no, no thin runways no for you guys, No thin runways, huh? yeah. 200 feet's a comfortable runway for us. It, on a 150-foot wide runway, you got about 3 quarters of a foot either side of center line, and you're off in the grass with the tip gear. So <laughs> yeah. 200 feet's Bad thing, I good, would assume. Absolutely. So what kind of minimum runway length like for you guys. 10, 000, no shorter than about 10,000 feet is a good runway. Yeah. Uh, 11 to 12 is better for our, our max weights for, for taking off. Speaking of the max runway. weights, what uh, what is you what was you guys' normal operating range? I suppose, it, I mean, it can probably vary as much as the wind, but. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the plane empty with no fuel and no bombs weighs about 190,000 pounds. <laughs> and then we can add to that. That's a big, 300, that's a big About 300,000 pounds of either fuel or bombs. So 488s are max takeoff weight on the airplane. So typically we fly with a 200 to 230, 230,000 pound fuel load. That's like half a million pounds. The B-52 also boasts updated features like the top secret all steerable undercarriage that adjusts to face forward on landing even when wind forces the aircraft to land in a crab. A 
apart from the cockpit layout, which is changed to a conventional side-by-side -side airliner arrangement, the production B-52s vary little from their prototypes. Work begins on the B-52A, now named the Stratofortress. I mean, overall, how, how is she to fly? It's obviously huge and probably doesn't have the best roll rate, but uh, sure. I mean. It's a very manual plane. Um, it's, uh, you know, I haven't flown a lot of different airplanes uh, other than B-52s, but it's, it's fairly roll responsive. It's got a yoke in it versus a stick type mm -hmm. of uh, control on it. Um, it's, uh, it's a very manual jet. Uh, it's responsive to your inputs. Um, pretty forgiving and you got no it, complaints. It actually is pretty forgiving. You can you can trim it up and fly it hands off very well if, mm -hmm. you, if, you, if you get it trimmed up. Otherwise, you got kind of manhandle thing. Boeing builds only three B-52A models, but the slightly improved B model goes into full production. Increased range is the bomber's primary goal. In-flight refueling, perfected in the late 1940s by Boeing's flying boom, helps achieve it. But refueling a B-52 in flight takes tremendous skill. The early piston engine aerial tankers reach a maximum speed just above the stalling speed of the jet bombers. With the arrival of the KC-135 Stratotanker, aerial refueling becomes relatively safe and practical. I assume the refueling receptacle is on the top? It's on the top and it actually sits center line in between the two pilots about three feet after the, of the pilot's ejection seat is mm -hmm. where it's at. So when you're refueling, you're looking up at the tanker and the boom actually comes up above the windshield off the top and down, which at nighttime with the boom light is, yeah. is kind of interesting Sporty. sometimes. Absolutely, you got to trust the boom operator. Extra large outboard wing tanks offer another way to increase range. These tanks hold 3,000 gallons and can be jettisoned in combat. With the first B-52s rolling off the assembly line, it's now time to start training pilots to fly the nation's first line of nuclear attack. B-52 bombers feature prominently in the classic Cold War era black comedy, Dr. Strangelove. By March 1954, B-52s roll off Boeing's production line in Seattle and into an immersion program where aircrew and aircraft become one fighting machine. After the B-36, the six-man crew finds the B-52 cramped. Every available inch is dedicated to fuel, payload, and electronics. All right, RD, that's where it all happens at the uh, at the cockpit, but there's not just two people in there, right? There's Correct. A multiple crew? You bet. There's two pilots, actually. You got a pilot and a co-pilot mm -hmm. that sit up top, facing forward, obviously. And then the electronic warfare officer sits up top as well, facing backwards, actually. And then downstairs, there's a radar navigator and navigator that both face forward. If you look up the two bubbles in the front, you can mm -hmm. see their hatches just in the aft portion of the actual that's the Evs. So the they're fur. they're down there in the black hole. Uh, absolutely. Oh, and they man. would actually face eject, it backwards. They face forward, but they'd actually eject downwards if they ejected. The rest of the crew ejects upwards on the airplane. I don't know. Ride. I don't know how I'd feel about that one, but I mean, you guess you got to do what you got to do. Beats the alternative. Where the Peacemaker has six gun positions, the B-52 has only one in the aircraft's tail.
all the way at the tip. It looks like that's uh, 50 cals, 50 cal 450 gun. cals. Roger that. 50 cal gun on the G model. Uh, we used a different gun on the H's, went to a 20 millimeter Vulcan cannon. You on guys those. put a 20 millimeter six barrel Gatling Shooter gun on, on the back. Roger that. This is actually a radar guided gun. The G's and the H's both had a radar guided gun. So the gunner actually sits up front in the cockpit area and it's all done mm -hmm. via radar control. And the D models, which a lot of those flew in Vietnam, the gunner actually sat right in the right in the back end of the airplane, had a nice view after everything going on. Nice view in the app. Nice view. Huh? Wow. <laughs> wow. For its defense, the plane relies on its performance and the new science of radar jamming. The Strategic Air Command has bragging rights to the world's best bomber. The Strategic Air Command places heavy demands on the B-52 and its crews, who become an elite corps worthy of their sophisticated new aircraft. For over 10 years, the Strato Fortress has one primary responsibility, delivering the thermonuclear hydrogen bomb. For the bomb to be a deterrent, it has to first demonstrate its potential. Throughout the 1950s, hydrogen bombs are detonated in the remote Pacific. B-52s drop many of these deadly payloads. Loading the most destructive device ever conceived takes the highly trained crews of the Strategic Air Command. Each cargo has a 100 megaton yield, 100 times greater than the bombs dropped on Japan. Unlike the weapons of the Second World War, the device carried in this bomb bay needs a parachute to slow its fall, giving the B-52 time to vacate before the cataclysmic explosion. The Strategic Air Command has fleets of B-52s in a constant state of alert. When the red phone rings, up to 100 stratofortresses can go airborne within minutes. It's a routine honed by practice. An instant retaliatory strike by SAC is seen as the nation's best defense during the Cold War years. So, Artie, tell me a little bit about how long the typical mission durations were. I know that it depends a lot on whether it's refueling or, or how much fuel you take off with, but just kind of typical any mission that you guys sure. run on. Our typical training sorties are running somewhere between six and seven hours. Um, on refuel, the plane full load could go about 10 hours on, on refueled with, with a good load of gas. Gosh. I mean, it is, it is a long range strike aircraft. That's what it's designed to do, and that's what mm -hmm. its mission is. So, we're Really, when you put the jet engine tanker with this airplane, you, you get Global Strike personified. Yeah, I mean, there it is. That's it. All pilots of nuclear-armed B-52s hold at least the rank of major. They bear the heavy responsibility of commanding aircraft that could change or even end life on Earth. But soon, the buff will find itself in need of a new job.
At the height of the Cold War, the B-52 is the most vital weapon in the U.S. nuclear arsenal. But just as jets replaced piston engines, so the B-52 and its high-flying Soviet counterparts get superseded by a deadly new technology born in Nazi Germany. In the early 1960s, U.S. and Soviet missile technology renders bombardment by aircraft practically obsolete. The emphasis shifts to another form of delivery, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Years of development produced the Polaris and Minuteman missiles, full-scale nuclear war at the touch of a button, without the need for manned flights. But SAC keeps strato fortresses in service. They still have a major role to play in the dangerous game of nuclear brinkmanship. Once an ICBM launches, it can't be called back denying politicians the luxury of saber-rattling. The B-52, along with Hound Dog standoff bombs, provides more leeway. B-52s could head to the very edge of enemy airspace, signaling America's readiness to attack, but still providing time for last-minute negotiations. The B-52 also employs the Quail Decoy, which confuses the enemy by mimicking the Strato Fortress's radar signature. From the Hound Dog comes the SRAM missile. A B-52 can guide these small and numerous missiles to targets up to 100 miles away with devastating accuracy. In 1965, the B-52 heads to Vietnam, armed with 24 500-pound iron bombs, instead of nuclear warheads. During the Strato Fortress's tour in Southeast Asia, B-52s dropped more than three million tons of bombs. Though the use of the high-flying bombers is controversial, the Strato Fortress proves its effectiveness in conventional bombing. Many historians argue that the heavy bombing of North Vietnam during the linebacker operations pushed the enemy back to the negotiating table and eventually to ceasefire. You know, we always hear stories and, and watch movies about the, um, you know, the, the heroes back in, in World War II, but you don't really hear a lot about the, the buffs going in on linebacker and taking some right. just nasty losses. Yeah, it's been kind of a quiet giant over the years. Flying over Vietnam, you know, getting telephone poles shot at yeah, you. Yeah, SA-2s. Not been threat, able to right? do anything yeah, about it. During December 72, during the linebacker operations, we lost we lost a lot of folks in, in B-52s and airplanes just like this G-Mile in front yeah. of us today. Other Vietnam operations employ bombs that personnel and aircraft can detonate later to coincide with enemy activity. Most B-52 raids drop standard 500 and 750 pound iron bombs like these.
facilitate quick loading and turnaround, the internal bomb load is prearranged on racks. So tell me, tell me about what what comes out of these sure. doors. First of all, well, how many doors are there? The, it looks like the three. Bomb made, yeah, they're actually all connected together. Maintenance can separate them, but the doors open one on each Pilot side. Pilot snow monkey exactly. with it. Exactly. Yeah. They don't mess with it. And there's room for basically three racks that would mm -hmm. fit in there in a conventional load, and we can drop 27 500-pound series bombs. We have a clip-in configuration that's a forward and aft clip-in rack that we could carry the bigger, like 2,000 pound type of munitions from. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a mount that we can put a common strategic rotary launcher in there, which is what we use for our cruise missiles, that fills up about two thirds of the bomb bay, and that would hold eight cruise missiles. I gotta tell you, one of the most significant emotional events I ever had flying was a uh, middle of the night mission, flying uh, air cover for a, a strike mission that was going on. And the night sky was illuminated by two B-52s in formation S turning and just, they just got done carpet bombing. Dropping I mean, train. carpet bombing. It was just mass destruction. During the Vietnam War, nose art adorns more than a few B-52s. Although the art is tamer than its Second World War counterpart, the missions are no less hazardous. B-52 crews cope with fast and agile enemy MiGs, anti-aircraft guns, and worst of all, deadly surface-to-air missiles. A combined threat unlike anything faced by American bomber crews of the past. Legendary test pilot Alvin Tex Johnston was behind the controls for the first ever B-52 flight on April 15, 1952. After a raid, ground crews repaired the bullet-riddled airframes and primed the Strato Fortress for the next mission. Sometimes the hits come uncomfortably close. Despite the low fuel takeoff policy, the weight of the bomb load stresses the engines, which need constant maintenance and frequent replacement. Might as well just go into talking about the engines. Sure. I don't even want to know what the thrust to weight ratio was for you guys, given the fact that you weighed almost half yeah, a million pounds. Yeah, it's pretty small. It's like 0.31 yeah. versus well, good, good enough, right? I mean, there's two, four, six, eight. eight. motors. Yeah, these are. this is the G model that has the J57s on it. The mm -hmm. H's that we're flying now has uh, Pratt & Whitney TF33, which puts out about 1,500 pounds of thrust more than these do. One thing each. We, each. Let's talk about speeds real quick. I mean, this is a... This is, a, this is a big boy, but you got eight jet engines on it. It's got to be able to get up and go if it needs to. Pretty well. Yeah, we do uh, our, our takeoff rolls max weight, close to 7,000 feet for the takeoff roll. 
max weight we on stick at 163 knots so mm -hmm. and we, we chew up close to 7,000 feet of runway to do that uh, we climb out about 280 knots and then we cruise our, our good cruise lines about Mach 0.76 is a, mm -hmm. is a good range line for the airplane how about if you say it's time to haul the mail. I mean, you know, I would assume that you can't go Absolutely. supersonic in this, no, but you know, low, low level where you don't want to be hanging out at 250 knots, sure. can you push her up a oh, little yeah, bit? Absolutely. Low, low altitude, we go up to 390 indicated. High altitude, about Mach 0.84 is our, our max speed mm -hmm. on the airplane. So for a big burr, she, she moves pretty good. The B-52 G and H models come equipped with an electronic visual system. The EVS uses infrared cameras and a monitor to enable the pilot to see in darkness and fog. The technology arrives just as the B-52 gets reassigned as a low-level tactical bomber. Tell me a little bit about the evolution of the, the missions of the buff itself. I mean, it was designed back in the mid 50s as i assume kind of a high altitude strategic bomber but it's done Absolutely. a ton of other things since then sure has yeah it was originally designed believe it or not in about a weekend with some boeing guys in a hotel room in dayton ohio doesn't surprise me and put it together and it was going to be our answer in the cold war of a bomber that we could launch from the united states and go to the soviet union with high altitude mission a pure high altitude mission mm -hmm. drop the big hydrogen bombs the Soviet defenses basically drove this airplane to change our tactic to fly low altitude so we could penetrate the Soviet Union airspace. And you guys in this aircraft have seen the full spectrum and gamut of nuclear yeah. weapon at 40,000 feet to 500 pound unguided Absolutely. bomb at 200 feet or whatever it Absolutely. is to, you know, now the, you know, the J series munitions as well. And the best description I've ever heard of this airplane is it's a dump truck. It can carry a lot of anything, anywhere. And yeah. over time, like you said, we've modified the airplane to lately with the J-Series munitions that we're getting a precision type strike with an airplane that was originally designed to be a high altitude bomber. Though the mission has changed, the Strategic Air Command hasn't unplugged the red phones or flashing lights. When the bell rings in the exercise or in war, SAC's awesome deterrent force swings into action. First, the general in charge vacates his ground base for the safety and mobility of an aerial command post. At the same time, crews rush to their aircraft, which are always on standby. Airborne, the General and the B-52s are in the best place to survive an attack and to deliver a response. When seconds count, everything depends on the high-speed takeoff. Flying low over the ground, each pilot awaits orders. This time, the B-52s get called back, but next time could mean a flight into enemy territory. Another successful exercise. After more than 50 years, the B-52 still performs well. 
1956 at Castle, 93rd Bomb Squadron. That's the first operational B-52. 2006, we had our 50th year anniversary of B-52s flying operational. So Quiet Giant's been around for quite a long time. Not a whole lot of planes can say that nowadays. Roger that. Well, for Quiet Giants, man, these things and guys like you have done some good work. So I appreciate Excellent. all you do, and thanks Sounds for your like time. It. You bet, Max. Thank you very much for having me. Almost as soon as the first B-52 rolls off the assembly line, the Strategic Air Command searches for a replacement. First, the ill-fated XB-70, an advanced design doomed by ground-to-air missile technology. Then comes the swing wing B-1 bomber developed by Rockwell International. The B-1 delivers high speed and altitude with the wings swept back and more economical low level flight with the wings forward. But the Carter administration can't justify the high cost and shelves the project in the 70s. In the 1980s, the revamped B-1B goes into production, not in the high altitude role, but as a low level, high speed bomber. The Strategic Air Command operates about 100 B-1Bs. If the costly plane can perform as well as its predecessor, the B-52, it'll be money well spent. After five decades of service through a period of unprecedented technological advances, the B-52 is still a weapon of awesome power and effectiveness. In fact, the Air Force has plans to keep the latest model of the B-52 in service until at least 2040. That's more than 80 years after the first bomber went into service. Now that's a tough act to follow.